Hello, everybody, and thanks very much for listening. I'm going to impart just some of the traits and what I learned back in 1998. Um, when I was in secondary school and going into university, I had great difficulty concentrating. At the time, I had sleep disorder breathing, and it was undiagnosed. I wasn't aware of it. But I was told that I was snoring, and then I was stopping my breathing. When I would wake up in the morning, I was waking up with absolute exhaustion. And when I was studying, I would be looking at the page, but I, my focus was not on the page. My focus was in my head. And with fatigue and with a racing mind, I could not concentrate. I got my grades, but it took a lot of work. Now, it was back in 1988, sorry, 1998, that I heard about the importance of breathing through the nose. Now, that might sound so simple, but I will say this. When you breathe through your mouth during sleep, and if you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning, you are not waking up feeling energized. You are not going to be focused during the day. You are not going to have the concentration that you need. And when we think of concentration, what is it? Concentration is your ability to hold your attention on a subject matter for a period of time without distraction. It's when you can place your undivided attention on what you are doing. Many of us go through the motions. I was going through the motions for the first 25 years of my life. The latter 25 years of my life, my concentration now and nearly 50 years of age is better now than it was when I was 16 and 17 years of age. Now, this is something that's often overlooked in the corporate world, and it's absolutely overlooked in our education system because we are demanded to concentrate, but we are not trained how to concentrate. And what's more, Social media, text messaging, social media alerts, um, emails, they are constant distractions to the mind. So the mind has reached an ability that we're often in this incessant and repetitive thought activity. And if your mind is racing, if there's a lot of thoughts going through the head, now it's all relative to person to person, that will in turn affect our concentration. I remember I was studying for one exam in third year that was in Trinity College in Dublin. And I'd spent three, three months studying for this exam. I was in the Berkeley Library, which is a library on campus. And I was studying just in the last moments before the exam. I was joined by a friend of mine, Terry Clune. And uh, Terry didn't open a book for the three months. He didn't open a book for the exam, full stop. But he spent 20 minutes just prior to the exam looking at my notes. And I could remember I was a 20 year old and I was thinking to myself, this guy has something that I do not have because he was not just looking at the note, but he was looking at the notes with an intense concentration and alertness that that information was going in. My habit would be I would be looking at the notes. I would get to the bottom of the page. I wouldn't remember what I was what I was supposed to be learning. I would have to start off again. And that's a lot of that's very inefficient. It's very uneconomical and it wastes a lot of time. So the short story is, the two of us went off, we did our exam, and we both got the same result. It took him 20 minutes, and it took me three months. Now, I'm sure that many of you are in the same position that I am. Concentration is often influenced genetically. There's no doubt about it that some people have naturally got a tremendous ability to concentrate. They have a calmness of a mind. They can enter that flow state, which is often coveted, you know, psychologists talk about how can we enter this flow state? How can we have our attention solely on what we are doing and that our attention is moving simultaneously with time? Terry Clune had it naturally. Most tremendous business leaders have it naturally. I had to learn it. You can learn it. What was the first most important thing that I did was getting my mouth closed at night. And you might think, well, that's so simple. But back in 1998, I remember after learning about the importance of nasal breathing and also by breathing through the nose, that is a calming effect on the mind, that you're more likely to breathe lower into the, into the lungs. And not only that, you're likely to breathe lighter. And I'll talk about that because there's a way to improve blood flow to the brain. And it's not how most yoga instructors traditionally talk about it. It's not how most breathing instructors traditionally talk about it, because the thing about breathing is with more, sorry, the thing about breathing is that less is more. So my first night back in 1980, 1998, 
with my mouth taped. And I woke up the next morning feeling okay, kind of getting used to it. I went to sleep the second night. I had my mouth taped. My nose was stuffy. I had nasal dilators. And I woke up in the second morning and I had an alertness that I had never experienced in my 20 years. Now we are sending kids to school. We are sending teenagers into, into secondary school and into university. We are demanding that our employees have good concentration. We are not looking at their sleep and statistics show that obstructive sleep apnea is a very common sleep disorder breathing. 90% of people are undiagnosed. And to give you an example, it affects 26% of men between 30 and 50 years of age. And it affects 43% of men between 50 and 70 years of age. Now, if you were ever told that you are snoring and then you stop breathing, you have to consider the quality of your sleep. Nasal breathing during sleep, we should always wake up with a moist mouth in the morning. Now, you could say that this is for the birds, that breathing is something that tree huggers do, the guys with the open sandal brigades. It's not about that. I work with SWAT. I work with special weapons and tactics. We've worked with Delta forces, which are above Navy SEALs. We are working with Olympic athletes. I have 200 instructors across about 40 countries, and we have 14 master instructors doing what I'm doing. My books are going into 14 different languages. I have wrote papers on sleep disorder breathing and breathing. So coming back to flow state, you can never achieve flow state if you don't have the energy to focus on what you're doing. So number one, get the mouth closed at night. How do you do that? Well, as I said, I taped up. Now, you don't have to go through the drastics of having duct tape or masking tape or anything like that. I'm going to show you a simple tape and it's called Myo Tape, and it's developed for the dental industry. And quite simple as it's as follows. We stretch the tape surrounding the mouth. And the tape, because it's elasticated and it's going in a bi-directional relationship, it's helping to bring the lips together. It's safe, it ensures nasal breathing, and it ensures a good quality sleep. And any of you who are tracking your sleep, if you're tracking it via Oura Ring, if you're tracking your heart rate variability, which by the way is a clinical measure of stress in the human being. Now we as human beings, we cannot cope with long-term chronic stress. You think you can, but sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. And if you look at the statistics on burnout syndrome, if you go to your medical doctor and you say to your doctor, doctor, I can't concentrate, I'm stressed. The doctor traditionally has no way of measuring the impact of stress on your body. But with heart rate variability, which is a very simple tool and measurement, you can, imp you can measure and qualify that the impact of stress has on you. If we look at elite military and elite athletes, they track their heart rate variability. They train when they are in, this, in when the autonomic nervous system, which is the automatic functioning of your body, when it's in balance. But if they are stressed out, they will not train that day because they have an increased risk of injury. So for the human being, in terms of the stress response and the parasympathetic response, we need to achieve a balance. And it's about resilience. And if we're constantly stuck in that stress state, if our mind is racing, if we're constantly running from one thing to another, if we're not able to hold our attention on doing what we are doing, that is having an impact on the body. Don't think that you're getting away with it. You're not. And I have worked individually with about 8,000 people over the years. I've seen people coming in with depression, anxiety, panic disorder, agoraphobia to elite athletes. And we have to train the brain. We have to train the mind. Now, how would you do that? Focus on your breathing. And what's more, it's not just about focusing on the airflow coming in and out of your nose, but it's about gently softening and slowing down the breath. There are three ways to help bring a calmness to the mind. The first way, of course, is to breathe through your nose, both during rest, during physical exercise, and during sleep. The second way, when you have your attention on your breathing and you are feeling the airflow coming in and out of your nose, gently start slowing down the speed of the airflow coming in and out of your nose. Really focus on softening the airflow coming into your nose and at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body that you are having a relaxed and a gentle breath out. The objective here is to breathe slightly less air. I'm looking solely at the biochemistry of your breathing now. 
when you breathe slightly less air, you will experience an increased watery saliva in the mouth, which is an indication that you've activ activated the body's relaxation response. And not only that, you'll start noticing that the temperature of your fingers and hands are getting warmer. People with poor breathing patterns normally have cold hands and cold feet, but they don't just have cold hands and cold feet, they often have brain fog. If you think of it this way, if you breathe more air, if you're in a habit of breathing a little bit faster and a little bit harder and a little bit upper chest breathing, that is causing your blood vessels to constrict. You have 70,000 miles of blood circulation throughout the human body. And if you breathe more air, your blood vessels are constricted. Think about how would you feel if I said to you, take five or 10 big breaths in and out through your mouth. You will often feel lightheaded. Mouth breathing is a stress response. Mouth breathing is activating the upper chest. The second aspect about breathing is that we should be breathing low. We should be breathing deep, but normally the interpretation of a deep breath is absolutely incorrect. And the reason that it's incorrect is because people, when they do take a deep breath, they will often take a big breath. But a big breath, as I said, what's happening is it's causing your blood vessels to constrict. And not only is it causing your blood vessels to constrict, but less oxygen is delivered to the brain. Now, if you have a habit of habitually breathing too much air, too fast air, your mind is in a state of agitation. The central nervous system, which is including the brain and the spinal cord, is aroused. In order to activate the body, focus on your airflow coming in and out of your nose and have a gentle and prolonged and relaxed exhalation. When we look at the breath itself, the inspiration or the inhalation is more sympathetically driven. That's when there's a nerve in the body that's wandering throughout the body called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve steps back. The exhalation is primarily, the main driver of that is the body's relaxation response, the parasympathetic nervous system. If you want to bring your body into relaxation, if you are exposed to stress and you feel that stress and that stress is eating you, it's impacting your sleep, you go to bed at night, your mind is racing, you cannot sleep, you wake up feeling exhausted and you have, you're in a vicious cycle. How do you bring the body into relaxation? Slow down your breathing, breathe light and breathe deep. I already touched on breathing light. Breathing light is about breathing less air and it's about breathing less air for a short period of time to the point that you feel air hunger and check the saliva in your mouth and check the temperatures of your fingers. Slow breathing, slow breathing for the last 30 years. It has been shown that when you slow down your breathing to a rate of six breaths per minute, and that's five seconds in and five seconds out, that that helps to improve heart rate variability. And when we're talking about heart rate variability, the timing between our heartbeats shouldn't be the same. The timing between our heartbeats should be both random and in rhythm. And therapists, really exceptional therapists, they will want to know if their patient is in a sympathetic state, if that person is in a, in a stress response, or are they in relaxation? And one very simple way to determine this is, you locate your pulse, and as you feel your heartbeat, you also synchronize it with your breathing. And as you breathe in, you are checking, is your heart rate getting faster? or is your heart rate getting slower? And as you breathe out, you're checking, is your heart rate getting faster or as your, is your heart rate getting slower? Now at heart rate variability, during rest, during the inhalation, your heart rate is faster. And on exhalation, your heart rate is slower. And that's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Now you can imagine this, heart rate variability is a measurement, but how do you improve it? And heart rate variability is that measurement of resilience, that word resilience. And resilience is about being able to cope with whatever demands is placed upon you because human beings, we should have resilience. And this ties back into, if you are in a challenging environment, you know, some people are well able to cope with that and others aren't. But as I said before, I had to learn it. By slowing down your breathing to five seconds in, and five seconds out, and you shouldn't hear it, it should be light. Because remember, when we're talking about breathing, we're talking about three dimensions. We're talking about the biochemistry, which is light breathing. 
We're talking about resonant frequency or improving heart rate variability, which is slow breathing. And we're talking about deep breathing. And I will come to deep breathing in a moment. So by breathing in very slowly to five seconds in and five seconds out and five seconds in and five seconds out, that will help to stimulate the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve, which is wandering throughout the body, secretes a substance called acetylcholine. And this causes a slowing of the heart rate and it helps to activate the body's relaxation response. The third thing that we need to be talking about is whereabouts in the body are we breathing? Are we breathing fast upper chest? That is a stress response. Look at your children, look at your own breathing. We should be breathing low. And a very simple way to, to determine this is simply put your hands on either side of your lower ribs. And as you breathe in, you should feel that your lower ribs are gently moving outwards. And as you breathe out, you should feel that your lower ribs are gently moving inwards. And as you breathe in, you should feel that your lower ribs are gently moving outwards. And as you breathe out, you should feel that your lower ribs are gently moving inwards. A few things, you may be going to yoga, you may be doing Pilates, etc. If you are, great, but don't hear your breathing because it doesn't make sense to go to a yoga studio and start taking in more air. Because remember, if you breathe more air, you blow off too much carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is not just that waste gas, but blowing off too much carbon dioxide by breathing too much air is causing your blood vessels to constrict and less oxygen to be delivered to the body. Slow down your breathing for periods of time during the day. Breathe in for five seconds, breathe out for five seconds, breathe in for five and breathe out for five because then you can influence the autonomic nervous system. To give you an example, if you look at heart rate variability and you look at any major and most common conditions of civilization, Look at the relationship between heart rate variability and high blood pressure, low blood pressure, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, burnout syndrome, high stress, COPD, asthma, irritable bowel syndrome. Individuals who are either physically unwell or emotionally unwell, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, they have reduced heart rate variability. So you can improve that. You can improve that by simply three things. One, nose breathe during sleep. That will improve your HRV. Many people who are tracking their heart rate variability via Oura Ring and other tracking devices have reported this. And we have experts in our field, including clinical psychologists who are our instructors, and we get this feedback. Number two, breathe slightly less air. If you're relaxing this evening and you might be having some downtime, you're watching television, have your mouth closed, breathing in and out through your nose, and gently slow down the speed of air that you are breathing and breathe about 30% less air, 30% less air. Continue gently slowing down your breath to the point that you have air hunger. Air hunger doesn't signify that oxygen has dropped in the blood. What's happening with air hunger is it signifies that carbon dioxide has increased in the blood. The primary drive to breathe is not oxygen. The primary drive to breathe is carbon dioxide. As you breathe less air, Carbon dioxide increases in the blood, and as carbon dioxide increases, your blood vessels dilate. But not only that, discovered back in 1903, it's called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-O-R. When you breathe too much air, and you get rid of too much carbon dioxide, your red blood cells don't release oxygen so readily to tissues and organs, including the brain. Now, remember my story going back to secondary school and university. I had no concentration. And I was the child who was admonished in school by school teachers. I was the guy falling asleep at a desk. I went to Uni Uppsala University for one year Erasmus program, and we were staying in student dorms. And the students used to report that I would be snoring so chronically loud, and then I would stop breathing. And of course, we had no idea what that was, but it was called obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the very same principles that I spoke about for improving concentration, breathing through your nose, breathing light, breathing slow, breathing deep or breathing low. Those traits will also improve your sleep quality. So what I would say to you is you, we cannot look at concentration alone. We have to look at sleep and we have to consider how is your concentration? Can you stop thinking at will? If I was to say to you, 
I would like you to switch off your mind. I would like you to focus on the subject matter. How long can you switch off your mind for? How long can you focus on a subject matter before your mind wanders? Or do you find that your mind is in a constant state of distraction, that you're constantly living in your head? And 20 years ago, I remember, you know, another story as well was I went on this meditation um, class and it was in the Shelburne Hotel off Stevens Green. And I spent two hours gently bringing my attention back to my breathing. My mind wanders off, I bring it back. My mind wanders off, I bring it back. And for that two hours, yes, it's challenging because you really do realize just how active and incessant and repetitive and in control that the mind is. We are not in control of our mind, but our mind is in control of us. And we have to consider this. The mind is the filter through which all of your life experiences unfold. And yet we never ask the question, how does my mind work? Now, I'm not talking about a PhD in the mind. You could write a PhD on how a banana tastes, or you could taste the banana. What I want to do is I want to taste the banana. So back in that two hour class, focusing on breathing, um, came out of it, walked down Grafton Street. It was the first time that I actually seen the street. I seen, I remember the colors, I remember the sound. I remember walking down that street. Now, I went to school in Sink Street in Dublin. I never seen Grafton Street all those times because I walked from one end of Grafton Street to another, living in my head. The next time you go for a walk, are you really there or are you living in your head? You're sitting at your desk. Are you really focusing or are you living in your head? And thinking is a habit. And as Oscar Wilde said, he said, thinking is a disease. And people die of it just like any other disease. And again, we are told we need to concentrate, but nobody shows us how. I'm showing you how. And I'm showing you how based on 20 years of experience working this field. I'm showing you how based on, you know, my self-application of putting it into practice and the benefits that it has gave me to my own life. And you may think sometimes, you know, we are so busy in the Western world that we feel guilty about giving ourselves attention. But remember this, social media is now consuming about two hours of most individuals' attention every day. People are lost in a screen. Those companies must be absolutely delighted. Facebook, Instagram, these social media, these tech giants, they must be delighted to consume two hours of your time every day. Spend less time at social media and spend more time focusing on your breathing. Your mind wanders off, you bring your attention back onto the breath. Don't just live in your head. That's how I lived, that's how many people live. And if we live in our head, we have increased anxiety, we have increased stress, we have reduced focus, we have reduced concentration. But above all else, a study carried out by a Harvard professor, Matthew Killingworth, they looked at an app called trackyourhappiness.org and they collected 250,000 data points. And they asked the question, if you were doing something, where is your attention? Because they noted that many people are carrying out a task, but their attention isn't on that task. Their mind is wandering. And they found that those individuals whose minds wandered the most were least happy. Of course, it makes sense. Because if we consider that 90% of thought activity going through the human mind, it's absolutely repetitive and it's often negative and it's often self-critical and we are sabotaging ourselves. I was sabotaging myself and I was sabotaging myself even if I was to set goals, then I would have all of this negative self-criticism coming in and that would get in the way of me achieving my goal. And it's not about setting a goal and constantly in a rush to get to the future. But it's about setting your goal and it's having your attention absolutely in the present moment. It's about the process of it. It's about not reaching and getting to the end because too often we set a goal, but we don't have our attention here. Our attention is moving to the future. But this does all come together. You know, when we think about breathing, don't just think of tree huggers. Don't just think of these open sandal brigades, because I will tell you this. If you want to improve your intuition, 
if you want to improve your creativity and if you want to improve your resilience and to better handle stress, we need to take control of the mind. We need to be able to create space and gaps between thoughts. We need to be able to hold our attention on what we are doing without distraction. And flow state is that it's effortless. You are absolutely immersed in what you are doing. There is no distraction. There is no mind wandering and time flies and you actually enjoy the process. And what's more, your quality of work is better. If you look at the quality of work of individuals with a distracted mind, they are in such a race to get to the future. The carpenter who might be putting down skirting board in a house. The carpenter, if that carpenter has an anxious mind, the mind is racing to the future that he doesn't have his attention on doing what he is now. He started the job, but his attention is in the future. That's a poor quality work. And you often know as well yourself, when the mind is in a state of agitation, our work quality is suffering. How many times have you sent an email in a state of stress? And then you went into your sent box the following day and you just looked at the quality of your email. And that's just a simple thing. So if I was to have a choice between an MA degree, which I earned from TCD, and for me, which was very challenging because of poor concentration, and it took a lot of time for me to get. And it's not necessarily that people are stupid or people are lacking intelligence. It's that people very often have poor sleep quality. That's not addressed. And they have poor breathing. And that's not addressed. And if we look at individuals with anxiety, people who are predisposed to stress, the literature shows that 75% of these individuals have dysfunctional breathing patterns. If you breathe through an open mouth, if you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning, I would strongly encourage you, get your mouth closed at night. And one sure way to do that is to breathe in and out through the nose, wearing a support such as a tape. Don't live your life stuck in your head. Give yourself some attention. Focus your attention on your breathing. Take your attention out of the mind. Slow down your breathing. Breathe a little bit less air and breathe low. And it's very, very simple. But that is, that is one way of biohacking. That is one way of activating your body's relaxation response. And with practice, your concentration, your focus, and your productivity will improve. Well, thanks, Patrick. Um, so that's really interesting and hugely technical for a lot of us. And as somebody who's been to yoga and has done the deep breathing, I now have to rethink all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, and it's going to be particularly challenging, I guess, in today's climate where people are wearing masks, uh, yes. face masks. So how, th that's an immediate issue. H how would you address that? Yeah, you know, it, a lot of people are wearing face masks and face mask is pooling carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is not that waste gas. As we said, carbon dioxide is the primary drive to breathe. Now, by wearing a face mask and by pooling carbon dioxide, you are breathing that carbon dioxide back into your lungs to increase it in the blood but that's actually opening up your blood vessels. That's also causing more oxygen to be released from, from the red blood cells to the tissues and organs. So if you, there's two ways to breathe. We can breathe in efficiently or we can breathe efficiently. If we're wearing a mask, absolutely and only breathe through the nose and breathe slow and breathe low. And with that, then you improve what's called alveolar ventilation, but you improve gas exchange. If you want to get rid of the feeling of suffocation while wearing a mask, don't mouth breathe, don't shallow breathe, don't fast breathe, even though that's a natural reaction. And that's what many people are doing. And then they're in a state of panic because of prolonged wearing of the mask to improve alveolar ventilation. And this is not just about wearing a mask. I've worked with people with chronic heart failure, people climbing Kilimanjaro, how to breathe to optimize what's called alveolar ventilation, nose slow and low. Great. So masks for everybody really if that yes. encourages our better breathing but okay let's take this to the business world yes. so you, you you've spoken about the obvious advantages for example for athletes for somebody climbing kilimanjaro how can one of the you know, hundred or so people who are watching here take what you've been talking about now and implement that not just for them but in yes. their workplace yes this is not theory you know yeah. we have to consider burnout mm -hmm. and exhaustion and reduce productivity because of stress. 
Can you imagine how much that is costing economically, socially, to a company and to the employees? This is about practice and it's very simple. Get your mouth closed at night. If you're walking down the street, make sure that you are breathing in and out through your nose. If your nose is stuffed, you can help unblock your nose by doing breath hold exercises. Mm -hmm. Those exercises we have available free up on YouTube, for example. And the more you breathe through your nose, your nose works better. And individuals with asthma, because Ireland here, we have, you know, seven to eight percent of the population with asthma. They often have a stuffy nose. They also will have, if anybody has rhinitis or a stuffy nose, you are 1.8 times more likely to have a sleep problem. You're waking up feeling tired. So observe your breathing and really pay attention as well. Just simply start off. You're sitting down at night. You have some quiet time. Take your attention out of the mind and focusing, focus it on your bet and see how often does your mind wander. Are you in control of the mind or is the mind in control of you? And when you have your attention and your breathing, slow it down, breathe light, breathe slow, breathe deep. And an easy way to remember it for those 1990s generation is LSD, light, slow, deep, light breathing. You can improve your blood flow. You can improve oxygen delivery throughout the body, including the brain. Slow breathing, you activate and harness the body's relaxation response and low breathing, you have a calming effect on the mind. I have absolutely no idea what you mean by LSD. <laughs> um, so, uh, but let's take it to the business world again. So I've got a team of 10 people and we are distributed working. Uh, we're stressed. Yes. Um, how can I get that team of 10 people to even consider what it is you're talking about? because you've convinced me because you're very persuasive. But mm. now I've got to get nine others on board and they're kind of going, he wants us to do what? Yeah, you know, like I wouldn't call this, I remember when I'm working with a police department in the United States mm. and they said they wanted to introduce mindfulness and I said, don't use the word mindfulness. Okay. This is not about mindfulness. This is about how can you improve focus and concentration? And, you know, first of all, the team has to have buy-in in terms of they have to realize, do they have concentration and focus? And it's not just about the workplace, because if the mind is racing in the workplace, the mind is racing outside of the workplace. If you, are not, if you can't focus on the workplace, you can't focus in your family life. I was in that state of a racing mind, and it is not a, a nice state to be. And normally in Western society, we want to drown out the racing mind and we drown it out with alcohol, by watching TV, by immersed in computer games, because we're going into a, you know, anything to avoid the thought activity. And this is not about mindfulness because we have to look at the physiology of breathing. If you have an individual who is in a constant state of stress, they are not being productive anyway. And I would even say, if you're having 10 people together, you have a project at hand, Spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes looking at the project, then take three minutes out and have people focusing on their breathing. Now, people might think it's airy fairy, but what I'm saying is this, put it into practice. There is a reason, there is a reason that elite military are doing it. There is a reason that elite athletes are doing it. This is just, as I said, this is not for the tree huggers. This is for everybody in society. And look at the concentration levels of people who are productive. Look at the concentration levels of people who are creative. And look at the concentration levels of people who achieve. They are not living in their head. Okay. So if there's one takeaway, and I'm yes. going to sum up now because we're, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, it, it is that last one. That's what they can do right now is actually yes. start practicing that straight away. Yes. Patrick, thank you very much for insight into something most of us take for granted. So thank you very much, Patrick. Very welcome. Okay.